Hello, everybody. This is Brother Luke, Sin City Preacher. Welcome to this episode of Bible Talk with Brother Luke. Today, I'm continuing my conversations with Brother Jason Jack, and we're doing a series called 101 Verses Proving Faith Alone. And uh, out of the 101 verses that we're referencing, uh, I think we're on number 90 today. So we've made a lot of progress, and uh, we've already got a lot of videos already uploaded in this series. So I, I hope you will take the time to go watch the series from the beginning. Uh, all the videos are on my YouTube channel, Sin City Preacher. I also hope that this will be a great, uh, useful tool for you to, to give the playlist to somebody who either doesn't understand or agree that salvation is a free gift by faith alone with no works required. So hopefully uh, that's what we're trying to accomplish here in this series. Um, brother, anything, any thoughts you want to say before we get going into verses? Uh, just ready to go. We're on the last 10% of our study here. So this is exciting, wrapping it up. Okay, then. Um, uh, when you're when you're teaching when you're teaching on this first verse, I'm going to see if I can't access that live chat room, and uh, hopefully that'll work. But so I'm going to try to do that once you get started on this. But the first verse we're going to discuss is Romans eleven six, and it says, "And if by grace, then it is no more of works; otherwise, grace is no more no more grace." But if it be of works, then it is no more grace. Otherwise, work is no more work. Okay, brother. So this is a great uh, verse in this series. And one of the most important verses in the series of faith alone, showing the contrast between receiving the free gift of eternal life by grace through faith versus our own efforts, our works. And this verse clearly distinguishes between the two. Um, and not only does it once, but does it twice just to make sure that everyone understands. Um, and grace is unmerited favor. And so, and if we look at works, it is efforts that we do to merit something, whether it's a wage, a paycheck, um, a position, you know, we are putting forth effort. Uh, we are working towards it or working for it. Uh, whereas grace is unmerited um, favor. We're not working for it. And so if we look at this verse in that context uh, or, or even using that lingo. Um, I think it can bring to light exactly what this is saying. Um, in less of a tongue twisting way maybe but if we just read it and if by unmerited favor of god then is it no more of our own efforts otherwise god's unmerited favor is no more unmerited favor but it if it be of our own works our own efforts to earn something then is it no more grace or unmerited favor favor otherwise what we're doing these efforts these actions to earn something is no more earning and and so if you look at it that way you know it really sort of distinguishes grace from works and you know the whole point of uh romans is to show or one of the, you know, it's got so many layers to it, but, you know, the main emphasis, the, you know, like the conclusion in Romans 3 is that we're not justified by the works of the law, um, but by grace through faith. And, you know, I, th I think that this verse falls in line um, with, um, with the study because we just did another verse like this in 2 Timothy 1 9 I think we went over last video that has this works and grace and showing the opposition of the two so just before I 
turn it back over to you, 2 Timothy 1 9, just to remind us of that verse. This is speaking of Jesus, who has saved us and called us with a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was given us in Christ Jesus before the world began. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, though, this list uh, is supposed to be uh, made up of verses that tell us, one, we're saved by faith. And two, that works are not required. To me, that is the perfect verse uh, for this study. Not every verse uh, out of 101, and actually some of the times, one of the verses is actually a, a series of verses. Maybe there's two or three, four verses in, that we discuss together. But um, that's really what we're trying to accomplish. Show people that, look, you're saved by faith. And not only that. Don't try to add any works to it, or otherwise you've nullified it and you've ruined it, okay? Um, and this verse here has is, is always been one of my go-to verses to, to prove this, this point here. So uh, it, it says, uh, and if by grace, then it is no more of works. Otherwise, grace is no more grace. Uh, so really what you need, we learn from this verse is that you cannot mix them together because then uh, grace is not in grace any longer. You've run it. It's no longer grace if you tamper with it. Um, so if we're saved by grace and you tamper with it by saying you've got to have circumcision, you've got to have water baptism, you've got to do the Sabbath, you got to do the dietary laws. Um, this is what they said in the early church that you got to do all these ju rules and regulations of Judaism. And then today, they're still saying you, you, you've got to repent of your sins and you've got to do A, B, C, and D. And uh, every time you add something to it, any kind of a work or legalism to it, then it's no longer grace. And uh, it's uh, it goes on to say that you know, a crisis, no effect here. You know, maybe we can find the whole context there. But really, uh, I, I got into a disagreement with a, a couple of brothers that um, when I was doing my teaching on verse by verse study of the book of Acts, and uh, I'd known them for a long time and we taught together and everything was hunky dory. And I was actually shocked when I got to Acts 15 1 because. There are men from Judea telling Paul's uh, disciples, you, you better get circumcised. You can't be saved unless you're circumcised. So, of course, Paul had to go to Jerusalem to the conference to try to straighten all that out. Uh, but these two brothers were arguing that, well, a person could believe incorrectly and still be saved. In other words, a person could believe that... Um, yeah, you, I believe in Jesus. I believe he died for my sins. I believe in the resurrection. I believe it's a free gift. Uh, but, uh, but I also believe that water baptism is required, or in that case, in Acts, circumcision is required. And I, I said, you cannot teach that. First of all, I'm, I'm shocked to find out you even believe that is the case, that a person can be saved by believing that it's, Faith and work is, is acceptable. It, it still will save you, even though it's not pure grace. I have a video titled Pure Unadulterated Grace, and to try to make this point. So it's got to be 100% grace. If you put one little tincture of iodine in that water, it's, it's no, no longer pure water. It's no longer pure grace, and therefore it's ineffective. It won't save you. Uh, so I ended up having to this fellowship, these two brothers, he says, I can't, because I said, I cannot associate in a ministry work with you if I'm going to worry that you're going to publicly teach this. And I pointed out this verse and uh, the other verses that are associated with this to prove the point that no, we cannot. Um, basically, what they were doing is they're giving a person the right to believe incorrectly. And think that well, I'm 
I'm saved anyway, even though I don't agree with you, even though I believe that there are some works that are required, that I'll still, I still get to go to heaven. And we should never, ever, like, open that door and, and give the person a license to believe that faith and works can still save you. Um, so that was my experience, and I stand firmly against it. So let me read the rest of this verse. You see, grace is no more grace, but if it be of works, then it is no more grace. Otherwise, work is no more work. So a person has to decide. You can get saved, saved two ways. You can get saved, as we did, by putting our faith completely in Jesus and rejecting the idea that we contribute religious works as, as part of our salvation. And we, we, we believe that, no, nothing we do contributes to our salvation. Our salvation is entirely based upon what Jesus did, not what we do. Or you could get saved, as it says here, that, uh, okay, if you... You can get saved by works, but it, you can't have grace and works together. So you've got to decide. Do you want to get saved through your works, or do you want to get saved through grace? If, but if you want to get saved by works, you have to have perfect works, perfect, no sinless life from your first breath to your last breath. And we all should be able to agree that that's impossible. Jesus said with man, it is impossible. <laughs> so, yeah, there's two ways you can be saved, but one way is impossible. So that's why you've got to understand that and then call on the name of the Lord. Okay, brother, what else do you think about this verse? No, uh, Amen. I think, you know, we can't as believers in the true gospel ever compromise that truth um, of the gospel message. No matter how many other people are teaching that you have to do this and this along with faith in what Christ did for you. Because like you said, if you mix faith and works, you know, and mix God's grace with works, it's no longer grace. You know, Christ has become of no effect unto you. Whosoever you are justified by the law, you're fallen from grace. Um, you know, we went over that verse in Galatians 5, 3, right before that, for I testify again to every man that is circumcised, and this is what you're talking about, you know, the um, men that were crept in unawares at this church at Galatia and were trying to get people back under the law and say adding circumcision to the grace of God and what he did for us through Jesus Christ's death, burial, and resurrection, and that we trust in that and rest in that, nothing else. You don't add to that. Um you know, he says, well, if, if you do that, then you're a debtor to do the whole law. And as you said, you know, nobody's ever been able to uphold the law. The law was given so that we could understand that we couldn't uphold it and to lead us as a schoolmaster to Christ. Um, so, you know, I, I think some people will get where they hear this so much, they get weak and they stop contending for the faith and they start compromising, um, you know, their heart may change where like the parable of the sower, it may go from that good soul back to a little bit of stony ground where, you know, they hadn't watered it in a while. They hadn't read, you know, all these verses on faith alone in a while or, you know, their, their roots aren't deep as they were where they were contending for the faith and understanding that and they're compromising um you know we should never compromise the truths uh of the gospel that's what saves nothing else can save so you know don't compromise and allow others to add anything to it um you know we should hate every false way um you know because that doesn't lead somebody to receive eternal life because ultimately if you add anything to it you're trusting in your works you're mixing your works with grace you're not completely resting in jesus finished work on the cross um you're not fully receiving that you know you're not completely receiving that message of truth um you know the the gospel the power into salvation which is able to save us mm -hmm. um 
one of the things I said in my video about uh, pure unadulterated grace is that um, I have a friend years ago that presented an idea to me that I'd never heard before. Um, he believed that the commandment thou, uh, of the 10, that it says, uh, thou shalt not commit adultery. Uh, he believed that that wasn't referring to uh, sexual relations. It referred to uh, mixing of the uh, Israel and the races, Israel with other, uh, you know, um, nationalities or religions. God wanted Israel to be separate and pure so that none of the false religions could come in and spoil um, Judaism. Uh, and so he, he, he said, and I, and I, I consider this, can I look, I looked up adultery and uh, adulterate. To adulterate something means that it's no longer pure. It's, it's impure. Uh, it's not a hundred percent. Like if a person had a, let's say you could trace your genealogy and your, your family line is completely pure from a certain nationality. Um, that would be unadulterated, pure, you know, English person or whatever. Uh, but as soon as another nationality marries in and now you're no longer going to say I'm purely an ancestry line from England. And so, uh, um, that's the same idea here is that uh, when, as soon as you adulterate it a little bit, it, it, it is no longer, as it says here, it's no longer grace. I'm, I'm probably just being redundant, but I think the point needs to be driven home that, matter of fact, this, was, this is what they accused me of. One of the brothers I had to finally reject says, I'm not one of those 100 percenters. In, in other words, that, you and I think you have to be 100% grace. You can't even have 1% of work. Not even just saying, well, it's just water baptism. Come on, that's just one thing we're going to require. No, 100% grace faith. You can't add any works or else adulter it's adulterated, it's nullified, it's frustrated, it, it's non-effective. Uh, uh, but he, he referred to us and those agree, believe in this, that we're the 100 percenters, and he's not a 100 percenter. A person doesn't have to have this pure, pure faith in Jesus. All right, enough said on that. Uh, I'm trying to find, I've got all these pages open, and I can't access now to get back to my Bible gateway here, so I guess I'm going to have to open it up again uh, in order to uh, look up the next verse. Um, it is Galatians 1, 4. And it, it says, brother, who gave himself for our sins that he might deliver us from this present evil world according to the will of God and our Father. And this is the beginning of Paul's letter to the church of Galatia. And obviously speaking of Jesus Christ in verse three, he says, grace be to you and peace from God, the father and from our Lord Jesus Christ who gave himself for our sins that he might deliver us from this present evil war world, according to the will of God and our father to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. So again, this is a reminder of Jesus finished work on the cross, what he did for us. He died for our sins, according to scripture, was buried and rose again the third day, according to scripture, to deliver us from death. He overcame death for us, and we overcome death through him. And that's the only way. Um, you know, this verse reminds us of 1 Peter 3.18, for Christ also has once suffered for sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but quickened by the Spirit. Um, second Corinthians five twenty one. for he made him talking about Jesus to be sin for us who knew no sin that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. So all these verses again, point to what God did for us in the person of Jesus Christ. Um, and this comes as a reminder of what Jesus did, you know, to 
for to die that he died for our sins that he died for uh the sins of everyone in this church that paul is writing to because of these people that were coming in and again trying to get them back under the law and teach them works and adding it to jesus finished work on the cross you know mixing works with grace and you know Paul comes down hard on this and in verse six says, I marvel that you are so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel, which is not another. Uh, but there be some that trouble you and would pervert the gospel of Christ. So it's happened for 2000 years, <laughs> you know, nothing's changed. People continue to do that. Um, and we'll try to add, their own righteousness with God's perfect righteousness. And if we add our filthy rags righteousness to God's perfect righteousness, then what we're really showing is that we don't trust in his perfect righteousness completely and what he did for us. Um, and we're trying to foot the son of God every time we want to add our puny efforts and our works to his perfect work, his finished work. Um, so Paul is telling the Galatians, don't do that. But right before he said, don't do that, you know, don't get under the, another gospel, which is not another, you know, these false gospels that are coming in, you know, he reminds us of what Christ did for us. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The, um, I, I often reference Galatians. Uh, I, I've said this many times. Uh, if, if if somehow the Bible was going to be wiped off the face of the earth, there would be no record, not one verse would exist. But I, I was told, look, you get to pick a book, and, and that book would be spared. Only one book of the Bible. I would pick the book of John, the Gospel of John. Uh, but uh, after that, I think my second choice would be the book of Galatians. Um, and then maybe Hebrews. Those are because what happens is in John we learn that you're saved by believing, and then in Galatians and Hebrews, Paul, and he has a, a burden that is, and that's just one. This is why I admire Paul so much. I'm not a Paul onlyist. That I, I, I rant and rave about those people because they they elevate him so that he's the only one. That we should listen to ignore what jesus john and peter said just just listen to paul so they go to way too far uh but i i do elevate paul in the respect that he had a responsibility and a, a served a purpose that was so important and that is uh, he was set at these churches he was really not really uh, serving as a pastor he was more like a, 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 um, a missionary and a church planter, an evangelist. So he'd start these churches and, and then he'd move on and he'd do another one. And then he'd be communicating with the churches he set up. And he'd get these word back that these people are coming into the church and saying, Paul, you're wrong. That we, we've got to keep practicing. We've got to practice Judaism. If they're, if they're Jewish believers, they say, we've got to keep practicing Judaism. If there are non-Jewish believers, they say, these Jewish believers are telling us we got to become Jews now too. And so what they were doing was, and I believe as I said in a recent video, that this is Paul's thorn in the flesh. If you read the thorn in the flesh portion and back up a couple of chapters and, and keep this thought in mind as you're, as you're reading those the preceding verses, I think you'll see that the thorn in the flesh is, as I would use today, the term uh, pain in my ass. This guy has been a pain in my ass, brother. All he does is go to all my videos and, and, and just mess with everything I'm teaching and trying to, to take people away from the grace of God. And he's trying to take them and, and pull them into religion. And uh, he's, uh, and he's just, everywhere I go, he's said, that's what Paul is dealing with. And he has this, these Judaizers tampering with all all the work he's done and spoiling it and that's what he does in galatians and also in romans but also in galatians and hebrews particularly he's addressing this 
And, and the, the point he's making uh, is not only did Jesus and John and Peter, and they, they, they say that you just believe uh, God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. But then they come and say, but, but you better get circumcised. But Paul says, wait a second. It says you just need to believe. Don't add circumcision or anything else to it. So Paul really is the, he's the primary per person to make the point that don't mess with grace. It's got to be pure. You got to be a hundred percenter. You got to believe a hundred percent grace and faith and no works. As soon as you introduce any kind of works or personal merit, then it's ruined and you make, Christ of, of none effect. He's died in vain. Uh, I don't know. I don't even remember what verse we're talking about, brother. Excuse me. Uh, okay, but all right. Uh, I got ready to go on to the next verse. If you're, uh, unless you want to add anything else to what I said, we can move on. I'm ready. That was good. Okay. All right. The next verse is uh, Romans one sixteen. Paul says, for I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. Well, this is, uh, you know, we just looked at Galatians 1, which is an incredible uh, six chapters in the Bible. And this is Romans 1 now, Romans 1. And um, you know, this is an incredible um, letter written by Paul to the Romans, and he is basically establishing again, just like to the Ro just like to the Church of Galatia, he's establishing in the first chapter of his letter to the Romans what saves you. Um, you know what just making sure people understand the gospel and the power that the gospel has um, and that good news is of Jesus Christ and his death burial and resurrection um, you know the Messiah that were people that people are waiting on uh, for thousands of years to redeem them to forgive their sins and give them the free gift of eternal life um, you know, Paul is pointing to the cross and saying, you know, your redemption is here. Um, and this good news is of Christ, the anointed one um, that was prophesied of, you know, for hundreds and thousands of years. Um, and so he shows, you know, how much he loves this message you know uh you know he was he was an apostle he was the um last apostle really when he when he saw the vision of of jesus on the road to damascus and uh was ordained unto you know his incredible ministry but he says he's not ashamed of the gospel of christ you know this good news because he understands the power in it um what it can do how it can regenerate uh somebody um to bring them from darkness into the light, um, to bring them from being condemned in their sins and in condemnation to be forgiven of all those sins and future sins because Christ died once and for all, for all sins. He paid it all. It is finished. Uh, he paid for past, present, and future sins. You trust and rest in his finished work on the cross. Um, so this is what he's saying and shows what the gospel does, that it brings about the salvation um, and the way that this occurs is by believing the death, burial, and resurrection, the finished work of what Christ did for us. Um, and then it goes on, for therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith as it is written, the just shall live by faith. Um, so there's no mention of our efforts, our works, you know, in this verse when it's discussing salvation and the gospel. It's talking about faith and belief 
And once somebody receives that seed, the word of God, that gospel, that good news that has that power unto salvation and they trust in it and they believe in it, have faith, they are born again. And it's your spiritual birthday. You have that regeneration. You're sealed by the Holy Spirit of promise. Then as you mature as a disciple, you become the sower now. You have that seed of promise and you're planting seeds and going to get those seeds planted elsewhere. Now, it's not your doing. You're going out and just spreading the gospel. Power, you're just the messenger. But this has always been God's plan that it is through man through the holy prophet since the creation of the world to spread this good news um, of God's redemptive plan and purpose for mankind. And Paul is saying in uh, to the Romans, you know, we we know now how this um, has come about. This mystery, you know on the other side of the cross is no longer a mystery. God has revealed more. He's dispensed more of these revelations to us. We understand now. Um, and that's why when it's revealed to somebody through faith, then they can reveal this through preaching, through evangelizing, telling others. That's how it's revealed from faith to faith as it is written again. You know, it says the just shall live by faith. And this is an Old Testament, you know, this is Paul quoting an Old Testament. This is quoting Habakkuk 2.4 that says, Behold, his soul which is lifted up is not upright in him, but the just shall live by his faith. So, you know, going back about dispensation and, you know, we always kind of talk about this, at least in a little bit of context. And the reason is I want people to see the big picture. I want to make sure that people understand that, the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ, that's always been what saved people since the creation. And it will always be what saves people until the end of the world when he comes back again. Um, you know, it's just depending on which side of the cross you're, you're on and what revelations you were given. But the gospel that God was going to save mankind through a redeemer, through a deliverer and deliver us from our sins to live eternally with him. That's his promise of eternal life, uh, which was founded before the world began. Um, it's from everlasting. That's an everlasting promise. Um, and it's through the everlasting Prince of Prince and King of King and Lord of Lords, Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. Well, when it says, for I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. Some people might wonder, why would he say such a thing? I'm not ashamed of it. Um, you see, everything that we find uh, in the epistles and in the book of Acts, maybe the first 30 years of church history, um, Everything that happened then is recorded in the scriptures. The same thing is going on today. I uh, I did a series of uh, early church heresies. It's actually a, a really continuation of early church history, early church creeds, early church heresies. It's probably 30 or 40 hours of content. And when I got to the early church heresies, it turns out that uh, everything that we're dealing with today I mean, Solomon said there's nothing new under the sun, but uh, these things are not new. Uh, Mormonism, uh, Islam, didn't it say uh, in the verse we, right next to the verse we cited before, that Paul says, even if an angel appears to you with another gospel, don't believe it, it's cursed. It's, uh, well, what happened with Islam and Mormonism? That's exactly what happened. Paul warned an angel could appear to you with a different gospel. And the Mormons got the angel Moroni. <laughs> you know, where I, uh, I don't think there really was an angel Moroni. I don't think, I think that's fictional. 
I think Joseph Smith was a con man that Apple just made up the whole thing. But what is humorous to me is that the, the name Moroni, if we take the eye off, it's moron. I think he, Joseph Smith was like playing a joke on everybody saying, I'm telling you this story. It's about an angel Moroni. And I think you're a moron if you believe this, but I'm going to tell it. <laughs> you know? So, but he actually defied what Paul says. Don't listen to even if an angel tells you something different. And the message in Mormonism is works for salvation. Same thing with Islam. Uh, uh, Muhammad was supposed to have got his message from the angel Gabriel. Well, uh, did some kind of angel or uh, uh, evil spirit, demonic spirit, appear actually appear to him to give him a false message? Uh, he certainly could have been, couldn't have really been the angel Gabriel because he would have told him the truth. Or did Muhammad make it all up too? I don't know. But the point is, they're doing exactly what Paul warned about. He says, look, even if you, you an angel appears to you, don't believe it if it's contradicting this. And then beyond Joseph Smith and Muhammad to, to their followers, they should be warned, look, if, if a leader comes to you and says an angel told him something and it contradicts my message, then don't believe him. But these people, they ignore, they ignore this warning. But this is not new. All of the heresies from the early years are still heresies we're all we're dealing with today. But all that, I'm sorry, sometimes I go on on in a tangent, but there is a point to this verse here. And that is, I'm not ashamed. Why would he be ashamed? Well, because he was probably taunted, just as you and I are, uh, say, Come on, you don't really believe in that easy believism. I mean, you don't really believe that a, a person can just believe in Jesus and be saved and you know, be a practicing homosexual or something or continue in lifestyle of sin. You don't really believe that, do you? Uh, they, they cannot fathom. That God loves us so much, he'll give us salvation as a free gift that we don't have to work for and earn it. And, and so they, they, uh, they either sometimes blatantly, uh, clear as day, they will insult us in, in that way, and, and we have to stand up and not be ashamed. No, it's that easy. And I have a video titled Easy Believism, and I say, I wear easy believism as a crown or a badge of honor. I'm not ashamed that I believe that salvation is simply by believing no works are required. And if you say that anything's required rather than just trusting in Jesus and his, what he's done for you, then you are cursed. You're anathema. And I send in my video, Cursed Be Gone. <laughs> oh, now, so that's only the first part. I'm not ashamed of the gospel. It is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth. So, again, I've made the point, but, you know, I, I have to keep in mind, brother, I hope you also keep this in mind, because sometimes I'm repeating myself over and over again, but we got to remember, some people will not watch the series. They'll just come across one of the videos. If, let's say that we have 30 videos in this series. Some people are not going to watch 30 videos. Most of them won't. They'll just, maybe they'll find this one alone and they'll watch it. So it's, it is worth our while. It is important to keep, continue driving home the same points. And the point I'm going to repeat again and again is that when a verse says, believe, and there's nothing else mentioned, then you should just accept that, that believing is all that's required. Because if something else was required, rather than simply believing, as it says in this verse, then that scripture is false. You should take it out of the Bible. You could, should say that Paul or anybody who put, wrote said that is a false apostle because if you don't, if you don't think believing, if you don't believe it's a tr the verse is true, that more is required. Or you have to believe that Paul was absolutely negligent. He was just careless saying such a thing. He should have told you everything that's really required. So here, when it says, just believe. He says, the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth. Now, to the Jew first and also to the Greek, 
I, we got to also remember that some of the people who watch our videos uh, have spent lifetimes studying the Bible, and they may know as much or more than we do, but there's many people that are complete novices, and so being very elementary is also can, is, uh, sometimes very important. What does it mean to the Jew first and also to the Greek? So if someone didn't know better, they might think, well, it's just the Jewish people and the nation of Greece, you know, not Italy or not England, or, but just the, the people in Greece, the Greek people. Now, Greek just means Gentile. That's when you find the word Greek used in these, in these uh, cases, you can think of Gentile, and Gentile means anybody who's not a Jew. So this is just saying, first to the Jews, the nation of Israel is the first ones that receive this good news. And, and then it was explained that, hey, this is for everybody in the world, not just the Jews, but non-Jews too. All right. Uh, I'll go to the next verse unless you want to talk more about that. Yeah, we can go on. Okay. Okay, so that's, uh, now this one is, uh, I don't know what it is, but I, when I see Galatians 3.21, I know this is a great verse, but I don't know what's coming up. I just see the address. You probably have it all memorized, don't you? No. <laughs> okay. Galatians 3.21. Control V. Galatians 3.21 is, um, is the law then against the promises of God? God forbid. For if there had been a law given which could have given life, verily righteousness should have been by the law. Okay. So again, this is showing you what can't lead to eternal life, keeping the law. Um, you know, Sin is a transgression of the law. And we know by the works of the law, no man is justified. Therefore, not sinning is not part of eternal life and being justified. It's by faith in Jesus Christ. Um, and this passage in Galatians you know, this is right in the middle. This is sandwiched in right in the middle of Galatians 3.16 and uh, 29, the last verse in the chapter, where it says, Now to Abraham and his seed were the promises made. He saith not and to seeds as of many, but as of one, and to thy seed, which is Christ. Um, and then going down to 29, and if you be Christ, then are you Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. So Paul is showing this dichotomy between the seed of the flesh and the works of the law and the seed of promise and God's grace and our faith in God's grace and this promise of eternal life. Um, and so he goes through this. You know, Galatians 3.21 is a great verse, but you just go on to the next verse. Galatians 3.22 is just uh, just as good a verse. But the scripture hath concluded all under sin that the promise by faith of Jesus Christ might be given to them that believe. Um, I always say this, you know, that the, the law wasn't given... You know, and I said it earlier in this video that the law wasn't given for us to keep perfectly, but to show us we couldn't and to be a schoolmaster to Christ. Well, this is part of that um, dissertation that Paul is speaking of, which leads to that verse, which talks about this. In verse 24, it says, Wherefore the law was our schoolmaster to bring us unto Christ, that we might be justified by faith. But after that faith has come, we are no longer under a schoolmaster. For ye are all the children of God by faith in Jesus Christ. So that's how we become a child of God is through faith in Jesus Christ, uh, not by keeping the law. And I'll turn it back over to you, but I could go on, you know, talking about this for a good long while. Um, you know, we've already looked at Romans 
Romans 4 um, discusses this same thing um, and hammers these points over and over and over. You know, if you're, if you're having a, if you're watching this video and you're having a problem trying to understand that it is faith alone, just read Galatians. That'll probably take, you know, maybe 30, 40 minutes tops. Um, and then after that, go to the book of Romans and read the book of Romans, which is, you know, may, almost three times longer, but still you can probably get through it in an hour and a half read these verses and see the context and see what Paul is showing, you know, the Romans and the church of Galatia um, using Old Testament examples of faith to contrast the law with faith. Um, and uh, hopefully, you know, pointing these verses out, you know, in Romans and Galatians on these videos will be a starting point for somebody to explore these verses in context, uh, these passages and chapters a little closer. Mm -hmm. uh, well, um, I, I, I've said this before, and I've said that before too. <laughs> I keep on saying I've said it before. <laughs> but uh, uh, I, I advise everybody when they begin to study the Bible, uh, don't try to read it from the very beginning all the way through. I mean, you should do that at some point. But before you attempt that, I would suggest you read the book of John over and over again, five times, 10 times, 20 times, so you understand who Jesus is and we're saved only by believing. That'll really drive the point home. And then after that, we have the Pauline epistles. Um, now, there are people to believe that the only thing in the Bible that is to us or, or to the church are the Pauline epistles. And they believe that Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, the Old Testament, um, um, he Hebrews, uh, James, uh, uh, all these other books, they're not, they're not to us at all. Uh, uh, they're, uh, and we should ignore them regarding salvation, but uh, only what Paul said, is that what they believe? That's what they believe. I will go this far, even though I disagree that you don't divide and discard pretty much and dismiss almost all the Bible and just focus only on Paul's writings. Uh, but I do say it is wise to study the book, John, then study Paul's letters before you try to take on the whole Bible and understand everything else. Because as I said earlier, in John, we learn you're saved by believing, and in Paul's letters, we're, we're, you learn that you're saved by believing, and don't dare add anything else to it, or you're cursed. <laughs> and But uh, the, the point I make, and I want you to know, if you're a novice, Paul's letters are begin with the book of Romans, and they're in order through the book of Philemon is where most people say it, Paul's letters end. But I believe Paul also wrote the book of Hebrews. So I would say that those are Paul's writings. If you concentrate on those, you're going to uh, do, do very, very well. And then you're ready to go back and read the Bible from the first chapter all the way through, because at least you'll have the most important elements of who Jesus is and how we get saved. You'll have that ingrained into you so you can read it with that in mind. Um, but... I forgot what made you said that made me go off on that tangent, but uh, uh, I will say this, that in this verse here, is the law then against the promises of God? God forbid. Uh, this might be another example. I'd have to look at the whole thing in context. Uh, I don't know if you saw the series I did on, uh, is, uh, is, was Paul a diatribalist pro uh, Did you watch that? I did. I, I watched you. I think you made what four videos. Yeah, I, made I watched. Um, I watched them all. I didn't. I got distracted on one of them, but I did watch them all, and it was very interesting uh, teaching. Something I'm, you know, would have to go back and sort of look at it now that I know sort of this um, whatever the word is, um, prosopopoeia. 
Prosopopoeia. It took me a long time to actually be able to say it without stumbling. and It's like a tongue twister, but prosopopoeia. But for those people who haven't seen it, watch that series. And I'm not asking you, brother, I'm not asking anybody else to agree with this. Uh, but after studying it, I think it's very likely that it's true. But I, I don't know to what extent I can apply it. I think the portions of Romans that I've talked about in that playlist, it's uh, pretty obvious. But in this verse here, uh, I'm trying to keep that in my back of mind as I read all of Paul's writings now. So that when he says something like, it seems like, wait a second, is, is Paul like introducing his, the adversary's point of view and then arguing back, back and forth uh, in his letter here? So it says, is the law then against the promises of God? It, you could think that that's uh, uh, somebody else arguing with Paul and then Paul answers, God forbid. But I don't know. I'm, not, I'm just saying that when I see something like this now, immediately I start considering that could this be dialogue instead of monologue. Uh, but going on here, it says, God forbid, for if there had been a law given which could have given life. Well, see, what does that mean? Thank you. Let's think about this. If there had been a law given which could have given life, doesn't that mean that there was not a law given that can give life? He says, if there had been. I think if I understand English correctly, that he's saying some people want to believe that, that, that that's the law's purpose, but if that the law was given for that purpose, then he goes on to say, Righteousness should have been by the law. But of course, in almost all his writings, he's arguing righteousness is not by the law. Uh, so um, in there, it's interesting, Paul's style of writing is uh, um, really, really interesting. He, he was the most educated of all the people in the, the New Testament writings, I guess. There might have been some people in the Old Testament that had that kind of uh, scholarly uh, you know, knowledge, I don't know. Uh, all right, now, I, I didn't make a note at the time. I failed again to do that. I think we started about an hour ago, or maybe, or, do you have any idea when we started? I think it was about 5.30 my time, so 3.30 your time. Okay, so you think we should uh, sum things up? Or you want to do that? Yeah, um, I think we should... Let's talk about this. I don't think we should go into another verse, but let's talk about this just a little bit more. Before okay. this sum up. And, and what I want to show a couple of things in verse 17, you know, it says, in this I say that the covenant, so the agreement that was made between God and man that was confirmed before of God in Christ, the law, which was 430 years after, cannot disannul that it should make the promise of none effect. For if the inheritance be of the law, it is no more a promise, but God gave it to Abraham by promise. And then it goes on in verse 19 to show what the law serves, its purpose. It was added because of transgressions till the seed should come to whom the promise was made. So... You know, I want to make sure people understand this again is God made an everlasting covenant with mankind. God kept his part of the covenant because God cannot lie. He knew that man could not keep their agreement for them in the person of Jesus Christ. That was what was confirmed before of God in Christ, this covenant. When you read back in Galatians 3.17. So in order for us to be restored and reconciled into this everlasting covenant that us in the flesh has broken, we must be in Christ. Who came, as we, as we saw earlier in these verses, and died for our sins, the just for the unjust. Um, so that's how we receive God's promise and become the seed of promise. We have to be part of that everlasting covenant. We've broken it by our transgressions in the flesh, but God's kept both parts through Jesus Christ. His part, the Father, the Heavenly Father's, and through the Son has kept our part. 
So we must be in Christ. How do we become in Christ? Well, 101 verses later, you know, just about we understand it's by grace are you saved through faith and not of yourselves. It's the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. So it's by faith in what Jesus Christ did for us. And in Romans 4, again, I alluded to Romans 4 being, you know, this same type of uh, dialogue that Paul is having this time with the Romans instead of the Galatians. But in verse two, it says, for if Abraham were justified by works, he hath whereof the glory, but not before God. For what saith the scripture, Abraham believed God and it was counted unto him for righteousness. Now him that worketh this reward, not reckon of grace, but of debt. But to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. But then we go down and I just want to read two more verses before we wrap up. Verse 13 of Romans 4 we see the same promise that is spoken of in Galatians 3.16, Galatians 3.29, and everything in between. So Romans 4.13 says, For the promise that he should be the heir of the world was not to Abraham or to his seed through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. For if they which are of the law be heirs, faith is made void, and the promise made of none effect. So again, this is... Verse 14 is a great verse that goes along with the first verse that we study today, Romans 11, 6, showing that if you mix works, um, you know, if you mix following the law, then it's no longer grace. You know, faith is made void. Uh, so this is just another way of Paul showing this. Um, and, you know, I, th I think this is this is. Um, great chapters to read galatians 3 romans 4 to really nail this down and you know you mentioned um re starting with the book of john for somebody that is a babe in christ new to the bible you know they've heard the word of god they believed it they trusted it um now what go on read the book of john confirm that faith that that mustard seed of faith that you have and and make that faith flourish by reading scripture allow god to guide you into more wisdom understanding and knowledge that will mature your faith after that like you said hit the pauline epistles really look at romans really look at galatians i would add one thing to that though um i would say read the book of genesis and read those 50 chapters understand the creation understand that god's our creator and that he's our savior on both sides and then read those stories uh these true stories these real events with real people that have spiritual truths behind their lives and that was god's plan and purpose for them um but read this is um 15 through 50 where are 11 through 50 read the whole book of genesis to understand um the story of abraham that it wasn't his works that he was uh doing that he was justified before god but his faith was counted under righteousness uh, It's what he believed uh and then look at um you know his his sons isaac and then jacob and going on jacob being israel the 12 tribes of israel and reading that whole context uh leading up into the book of exodus if you just understand those stories and read them and have those in the back of your mind maybe you know with exodus where you're looking at moses delivering the people from the bondage of egypt um then a lot of Pauline's epistles that refer back to those stories to show spiritual truths are going to make more sense to that person. Um, so book of John to start, Pauline epistles, add Genesis, and then cover to cover it as much as you can. <laughs> the, uh, I guess I'll just uh, sum up my thoughts on this verse uh, that uh, when we look at all the verses we've talked about we've we've seen a certain point being made a lot of different ways 
Um, verses say, you're saved by believing and nothing else is mentioned. So that means faith alone, because if there's something else was required, it should have been included in the verse. Um, you have verses that take the other approach that say, you can't be saved by the law. Like this verse here saying, that's not the purpose of the law. If you can be saved by the law, then, then uh, uh, but that's not why the law was given. It was to, to, to make us understand that we need to be saved. We need a savior to save us instead of us following law. Um, and then you have verses that Paul, uh, that I have to, as I give him all the credit, in that he combines the two things and says, you're saved by believing and don't mix law with it at all. Be careful not to mix law or you've ruined it. Um, but when we talk about, when we use the words about the law or works, what that really means, I would say to the, to the novice who's, who's new to the Bible, is really all that really means is religion. Now, have you ever heard it expressed this way? Um, he follows that diet religiously. He exercises religiously. It means that you're very disciplined about following a set of rules and regulations about the way that you're doing your exercise or your diet or, or whatever it is. He follows his routine religiously. Um, but that's what religion is. It doesn't matter if it's Christian religions or if it's all the other religions of the world. Every religion is really the same. There's not a bit of difference because all the religions really is based on uh, establishing a set of rules and regulations that you must follow in an attempt to earn approval or acceptance from God. That's what all religion is. And many people have said Christianity is not a religion. It's not a system of things that you're trying to do or to work your way to heaven. Christianity is not a religion. It's a relationship. A relationship with Jesus, our Savior, God. And the relationship is a relationship of believing in him and who he is and believing in him in that he makes promises and you believe that he's faithful to keep the promises, the promise of you get to have eternal life in heaven. Uh, believing uh, on him, which means I'm depending on him to get me to heaven. I'm relying on him to get me to heaven. I, I, I have confidence in him, not in myself, in my ability to be religious. So to the novice, I would say when we talk about works or laws and legalism, all that stuff, if you just think of it in terms of don't try to get to heaven by being religious. Instead, believe that you're going to – one friend of, of mine I've talked for two for a long time, but he, I think he summed it up so significantly. He says, you must believe that the only reason you're going to heaven is because of Jesus, not because of anything you've done. you got to, that's, that's what you have to believe. It's entirely on Jesus, not anything you do. Uh, as soon as you think that it's Jesus plus you have to do some kind of contribution to your salvation to earn it, then you've ruined it. Uh, and so this verse here is basically saying that uh, that's not the purpose of the law. We've had a lot of verses like that, and uh, I made a video titled, Works Never Work. You couldn't work your way to heaven in the Old Testament. That wasn't the purpose of the law. Uh, you can't work your way to, to heaven today. And why can't, can't you? Because the, the, the level of work that's required, the, the, the level of religiosity is 100% perfect. You could not fail in one point. And that means you can't even have one bad thought. Jesus drove this point home so much. He says, oh, you think it, as long as you do the right things, you're okay. But no, even if it's your thoughts, I'm going to judge. So he wanted to know how strict this judgment will be if you want to get to heaven through your, your own righteousness. So that's why works never worked. Works will not work. Works will not work in the future. It's always been trusting God to be your Savior. And now, with the New Testament, God has revealed to us the Savior God we need to trust this for is, is Jesus. All right, brother, uh, you going to give us some up the study now?
Yeah, I'll do it real quick. We probably ran a little bit over, but um, I thought this was a great discussion. We did a couple of verses in the book of Romans and a couple of verses in the book of Galatians, looked at other verses in context with this, um, and sometimes referring to other chapters within uh, Galatians and Romans. Uh, so really today's study uh, really focused on um, that we can't mix our efforts with God's grace or it's no longer grace. Um, we don't rely on our works, but rest in Jesus Christ's finished work. Um, that's where salvation is found. That's the good news that we trust, believe, rest in, and um, that is how we receive eternal life and not anything that we do of our flesh. You know, Jesus says the flesh profiteth nothing. It's the spirit that quickeneth. And we receive that Holy Spirit of promise through faith in Jesus Christ. Okay, then, brother. Uh, I guess uh, we're on 94 next time, aren't we? It gives, leaves us six verses. I'm thinking that we'll probably have two more of these studies and this will be completed. Okay. Uh, all right. Uh, I did. Um, I think I was able to access the chat room, but I didn't see any activity in it. So if I did it correctly, uh, I'll, I'll keep doing this in all of our future uh, uh, live discussions to see if anybody uh, participates in the chat room so we can recognize you if uh, you decide you want to uh, join in. Um, but, um, uh, brother, thanks again for participating. Uh, it, it, it was uh, another great study, as you said. I don't know. I, every time I do one, I feel like, oh, this was one of the best. But that's how good all of it. I can't think of one time where I was like disappointed that somehow it wasn't fantastic. Uh, but to the viewers, the last thing I'll give you this thought is if, if you have not put your faith in Jesus for salvation, then please do it now. I hope you understand from this study and all of our other videos that salvation is a free gift. Jesus offers this gift of eternal life in heaven to everyone. There's no exceptions. Whosoever believeth on the Lord shall be saved. So put your faith on Jesus, depend on him completely, reject anything else as a means of salvation and rely 100% on Jesus and don't, don't put any faith in your own performance and, uh, to, to earn your way to heaven. And uh, if you do that, make a comment, let me know. We'd be thrilled to know that somehow our, through our efforts, uh, you learned the truth and, and uh, believed. So thank you for watching. And bless you all in the name of our great Savior God, Jesus.